What central theme runs through all the Bible? How would you respond, Jesus, the plan of salvation? The cross, yes to all three, of course, but these three important topics unfold against another all-encompassing theme. The great controversy, this theme pervades the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. Well, hello, good morning once again. Welcome to Whisper and Hope Sabbath School Lesson Study. And we're here this morning with, guess who? The LSAs. It's the middle of the week, Wednesday. We are studying this week, motivated by who? Lesson 7. And so... We're going to go into our lesson this morning, but before we go into our lesson, we're going to invite Ella Ellis first to greet the folks this morning, and then we'll have Dr. Ellis, and then we'll go right into our other preliminaries. We'll have Dr. Ellis, Elder Ellis doing for us our prayer this morning, and Dr. Ellis will read for us our memory text. Well, good morning, good morning. A very beautiful morning to everyone. Just want to greet you in Jesus' name as we study God's word today. May his Holy Spirit just inspire our mind. Yes, good morning, everyone. Good morning, all our listening audience. Good morning, Brother Joseph. It is really a joy being on the platform this morning. God has been good to us, and I pray that we will continue to study his word and to be prepared for his soon coming. Absolutely. We'll now have our prayer by Elder Ellis, and then our memory text by Dr. Ellis. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for bringing us to see this midweek hour. You have been awesome to us over the past days of the week, but we have come to the realization that past blessings cannot su suffice. So we want to thank you and we want to ask you to be with us as we go through this day, as we go through the remainder of the week. Bless us now as we seek to study your word. Holy Spirit, inspire our minds and teach us what we ought to know. Help us also to rightly divide the word of truth and may all of us be blessed. And Lord, we pray that as we glean from your word, that you would help us to put into practice and may we be watching, may we not only be looking for your coming, but may we hasten your coming in Jesus' name. Our memory text is taken from Isaiah 25, verse 9, and it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Okay, so this morning, uh, Elder Ellis, we are looking at the topic, Motivated by Hope. And then we are looking at the, our subtopic, at the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14. And as I saw the topic, Motivated by Hope, only one thing came to my mind, but I don't know what you're going to deduce from it, is that song... In our hymn, Church Hymn 214, it says, We have this hope that burns within our heart, hope in the coming of the Lord. But Elder Ellis, what came to you as you looked at our topic and our subtopic this week? Well, what I see, motivated by hope. You know, there's that old Arabian proverb which says, He that has health has hope, and he that has hope has everything. And so hope, is a great motivator. Without hope, one would live a dismal life. In fact, I don't even know. One would just merely be existing rather than living a life that has purpose. Hope help, help us to get up in the morning, go out, do what we have to do. All is being motivated by hope. Hope in something. Hope in something. Perhaps hope in getting the salary at the end of the day or end of the week or perhaps end of the month. Hope that we would be successful in our exam. Hope in so many things. But in this case, as we study the Word of God, we know that we are looking at hope in the coming of the Lord. That same song that you really refer to, we have this hope that burns within our heart, hope in the coming of the Lord. Dr. Ellis, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, and then you no. can take us right into our memory text. Yes, the memory text, 
and it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. It's just envisioning the sky roll back as a scroll. And we are there looking at our loving Savior. We have waited for him and he will save us. There is, as Elder Ellis say, it is dismal to live without hope. And just the hope, the idea, the knowledge, the thought, the confidence that Jesus will come again and save us unto himself, to take us out of this wicked world, to take out of this world that is filled with pain and heartache and grief and sorrow and disappointment, and to take us unto himself where there will be joy forevermore. It says we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation, the salvation that Christ has paid the price with his own blood so that we can enjoy eternal life. I think it's marvelous. Absolutely, absolutely. Elder Ellis, anything to add on our memory text of this week, your insight into the memory text? See, when I look at the memory text, what it is telling me, and it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. You know, it means that I'm a part of something, and there's a number of us who are experiencing the same thing. This is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. So this is where hope, where we have reality has met hope. We have been waiting, we have been hoping for him. And now it's the realization that he is coming. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. It means that because it's our God, it means that I am saved, I am redeemed, and I can sing that song, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I like this. I long for this day. I hope for this day. And I'm being motivated that come what may, I want to be in that number which is mentioned as hour i want to be in that number when he puts in his appearance amen 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 again we're gonna go into our first question for this morning dr ellis i'll ask you to read mark 1 15. elder ellis will read galatians 4 4 and i'll read romans 5 6. mark 1 15 and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe in the gospel Good. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now the question is, Dr. Ellis and Elder Ellis, what do these verses tell us about God's timetable for the first advent the question will go to dr ellis first then elder ellis will continue giving his contribution on the topic right so the idea that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand you know jesus said that because the whole prophetic timeline was so perfectly met and no wonder Miller was was intrigued with in with the way everything was falling into place. We are looking here at the time is fulfilled. Jesus now is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. He is saying, repent and believe the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God. The mission of God is the, to preach the gospel into all the world so that men and women can inherit eternal life. It says, but when the fullness of time has come, God sent his son. So all the prophecies, and it says born of a woman, born under the law. So all the prophecies pointed to the first advent of Jesus Christ who laid down his life as a ransom for people like you and I. And it boils right, it came right down on time to the birth and ministry 
of Jesus Christ. You know, the scripture refers to when the fullness of time is come. And it just goes to tell me that God has a timetable. God's time knows no haste nor delay. God appeared in the fullness of time when the time, when it was the right time. And these things were pro prophesied when Jesus will come. And he came at just the time. Prophecy shows us that. History shows us that. And so the kingdom was at hand. What kingdom are we talking about? The kingdom of grace. You know, when Jesus puts in his appearance, the kingdom, in fact, ever since man died, man was exposed to grace, the kingdom of grace. But here it is, here it is that Jesus puts in, put in his appearance in the fullness of time so that at that time, what happened? The gospel went to everyone because as we would see a little later, that the work was given so that Jesus' preparation could have been made. And so at the fullness of time, Jesus came. And at that same time, God's people, the one who was elected, they had messed up so badly that the, that the gospel had to go to all and sundry. In fact, the gospel should have always gone to all and sundry. But then God's people were the ones designated to proclaim the gospel in the fullness of time jesus came and he was rejected the gospel was spread by jews as well as gentiles and we will talk a little more about that a little later okay read for us again now dr ellis you'll read for us again first this time Daniel, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Daniel 8, 14 says, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Elder Ellis, you will go first this time. And the question is, what event was to occur at the end of the 2,300 days? Well, as Daniel says in Daniel 8, 14, that at the end of the 2,300 days, days or 2300 years in prophecy because when we look at prophecy in numbers 14 34 as well as ezekiel 4 6 one prophetic day is equal to a year daniel was given the instruction that at the end unto 2300 years or days then shall the sanctuary be be cleansed. Now, Daniel thought, in fact, the reformers thought that this meant that judgment will be instituted. In fact, yes, they were correct, but William Miller thought that the earth would be destroyed by fire, and then Jesus' reign, the, that's the kingdom of glory, will be ushered in. But that was not the case. When we look at the sanctuary being cleansed, it refers to the sanctuary in the olden times. In fact, that's the way William Miller would have looked at it. The church was destroyed during the destruction of Jerusalem. The sanctuary system was destroyed. And so he was confused at that time as to what this really meant. But we know, having studied, Having looked at the word, it meant the heavenly sanctuary. There was no, no, since Jesus left, the sanctuary system was done away with. The high priest, in fact, the, was, the system was done away with. There was no more shedding of blood. Jesus shed the blood. He is the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation. The sanctuary system typified. It was a type of Jesus' coming and dying. And so even the veil of the temple was rent in twain. The mercy seat, as it were, was exposed. So now there was no earthly priest to take you before the, the throne, the mercy seat. Jesus is the mediator. And so that system was ushered in. And so we know from the study of God's word that it was not the earthly sanctuary, but it was the heavenly sanctuary. And indeed, it was the beginning of judgment, what we call the investigative judgment or the pre-advent judgment. And that took place at the end of the 2300 days or 2300 years 
prophecy. Okay, so Dr. Ellis, as Elder Ellis rightly said, William Miller looked at this whole prophecy. He was right. The timeline was coming to an end. The longest time prophecy in history was coming to an end. 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. He looked at it, he compared it to the earthly sanctuary where on the day of atonement, that if you were not right with God, you would have been cut off if you had not made a repentance for your sins. And he concluded that this would have been the executive judgment and where God would have returned to earth and issued reward to all those who have were just and who those who were unjust as a consequence that day in 1844 became known as the great disappointment what actually happened so william miller he miscalculated he misinterpreted and that was the thought pattern of many scholars in his days so when he looked at the prophecies and studied it diligently up to that point to see everything was on point he with the foreknowledge or with the idea that the earth was to be purified by fire and the sanctuary that is being spoken about was the earth so he concluded that within 25 years jesus will come and will take his people and that excited him a lot it excited all those whom he spoke with and they were looking forward to the kingdom of god taking precedence or purifying this earth but it was a serious miscalculation as you rightly said which was a permitted miscalculation so that the men and women would have gone back to the Bible and actually begin to understand that Jesus is now in the most holy place in the sanctuary in heaven, atoning for our sins. So right now, as we speak, we have the investigative judgment going on. He that is just, let him remain just still. He that is unjust, let him remain unjust still. God is in the most holy place, atoning for our sins. And we are grateful that we have a mediator who has paid the price with his blood, atoning for our sin. It gives us great hope and courage. There's a song, Dr. Ellison. Uh, Elder Ellis, that says, The work is begun with those who are sleeping soon. Will the living here be tried? And so, uh, Elder Ellis, Dr. Ellis is speaking of the investigative judgment. And you yourself spoke to it, Dr. Ellis. And I, my understanding of it is that God is going to come up with our names one day. We're not going to come one day before some wide gathering and no court hearing is heard and people hear it. It is happening now. And so my name could come up and yes. what state it would find me. It's kind of dreadful when I think of it and say, right. man, got to get ready. Never know if your name came up today or it's going to come up tomorrow. And, but considering that we're in the fact when our cases could come up before God now, what advice would you give to Christians living in these times, Dr. Ellis and Elder Ellis? So the idea that we love the Lord, the idea that we live in harmony with God's word, that we enjoy being in his presence, it gives us great joy and uh, delight being in his presence. So we have no fear. We do not worry about the judgment because the judgment is joy for those who love the Lord. We know that when that time comes, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is going to judge us righteously. So in my, I mean, in my thinking, I feel very confident and very hopeful and very peaceful and calm 
in the fact that Jesus is my friend and Jesus is my advocate, Jesus is my defender, and Jesus is my savior. And I know as long as I keep my hand in his hand, sanctification is going to be a lifetime. Many days and every day I'm going to die to self. Every day I'm going to come up with issues that I know need to be gotten rid of. And by God's grace, I will be willing and I'm willing to do so. But constantly I am living justified because I know that he is, has covered me with his robe of righteousness. And so when I come up before the judgment seat, no one would be seeing Corolla Ellis. They will be seeing Jesus Christ. We live in absolutely, a world, absolutely. We live, right ahead, Ellen. We live in a world where the justice system is a messed up system. And so once you're talking about judge and judgment, even though one know, one knows that he or she is innocent, yet when you go before the earthly justice system, one has to be concerned because you never know how it will turn out. However, God is the righteous judge. His justice system is fair. He doesn't make mistakes. He knows everything. The Apostle Paul reminds us in the book of Romans that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Once we have repented, once we follow Jesus, once we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us and we follow what the Holy Spirit says, we are not condemned. We would have already asked for forgiveness and our case, as it were, our name would be written in the book, Lamb's Book of Life, and we ensure by following Jesus Christ that it remains there. So we have no fear of the judgment because when we accepted Jesus, we were covered by his robe of righteousness. We have been justified. And as Dr. Ellis said, we begin to live the sanctified life. So daily we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Daily we take on the character of Jesus Christ. Yes, we would make mistakes, but we are reminded in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we live, we build a relationship with Jesus Christ. We become wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we, as Dr. Ellis says, we recognize that Jesus is the judge. He is the advocate. It's a nice thing to go into a courtroom where you have friends in the court. The judge is your father. The lawyer is your brother. And he is the one who would have already covered us with the robe of righteousness. So when the devil wants to bring accusation, because he's the accuser of the brethren, and at that time, he would not be able to accuse like what he did with Moses. Still, we see Jesus say, hey, get off that territory. My blood has been shed for this person. So even though judgment might be fearful or sounding fearful, we have a friend in court. And therefore, we have no fear. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, and I am coming again for you, that where I am, there ye may be us. All those are comforting thoughts. Therefore, we have no fear of the judgment once we keep our eyes on Jesus, and we continue to build that relationship with him. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Ellis, as you went through today's lesson, what is your main takeaway? What is something that stood out to you that you want to share with us or read to, it to us? My takeaway is that the hope that I have is motivated by the hope that Jesus Christ would have given us all around. The, the lesson tells us that the Old Testament has so many hope concerning the coming of Jesus Christ and the New Testament also, those two witnesses that we would have looked at last week. God did not leave us comfortless or 
hopeless. And daily he is with us. He walks with us and talks with us so that that hope and faith could continue to grow in him. And when the fullness of time is come, he will put in his appearance. Whether he calls us before, whether he calls me before or not, still he will come. Let us watch and be ready. I have to watch and be ready because he is coming for all those who love his appearing. I'm comforted by the thought that, and the lesson gives me that comfort, that I need to keep hope alive. Jesus is coming soon, and I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Amen, amen. Dr. Ellis? Looking at the prophetic timeline and seeing the accuracy in God's words, seeing his foreknowledge of every saint, and his uh, warning his people or enlightening his people about things that will come to pass. It gives me great confidence to know that now the sanctuary is being cleansed, that Jesus is in the most holy place, that we are at the toenail of his appearing. And I look forward with great anticipation. I mean, there are so many people that I would want to see saved. And by God's grace, I'm asking him to help me to put away self so that I can reach these people. But my hope is that on that great getting up morning, that a lot of us and our loved ones will be saved in God's kingdom. And I'm looking forward to that day. Oh, I want to thank Dr. Ellis and Elder Ellis for so clearly bringing to us our lesson this morning. Truly, they are always clear with us as they discuss the lesson. And I want to leave with us this point. We looked at today the longest prophetic timeline in history or in the Bible. And it says 596 in the Advent hymnal says, Look for the waymarks as we journey on. Look for the waymarks passing one by one down through the ages past the kingdom for where are we standing? Look the waymarks or my friends, as we studied with us today, you recognize that we are at the end of time. Let us all be ready for in such an hour as we think not the son of man cometh. God bless you and have a wonderful day.